Turns out, using my wife's old bath towels to protect my junkyard seats while I welded in new brackets wasn't the best idea in the world. These are not exactly flame retardant. I do keep a couple of fire extinguishers in the shop, but none were close by. Thankfully, my bottle of cheer wine was still half full. And if you've never had cheer wine, besides being good at putting out fires, it's actually quite delicious. Still, you're definitely not watching my best day ever. It is time to stop stalling on the project. I said we'd do two videos ago. The floors in this Corvette are absolutely rotten out. Just a quick look will show you that like my underwear drawer, most of what you see here is well out of date and has way too many holes in it. So this time I'm committed. We are cutting out these floorboards, welding in two fresh new stampings to make everything nice and clean and sanitary. Plus bonus, I found two new, well, new to me, seats in the junkyard from a very different kind of car that I think are gonna be a good fit in the Corvette and came cheap. So we're gonna fabricate new seat mounts to get them mounted up in here and see how they look. The only problem here is that I have never done any of this before. So we're gonna be learning as we go, but it should come out all right. The first step is to get the Corvette body way up in the air so I can crawl up underneath it easier. It's about right now that I decided it's way past time for me to get off my wallet and invest in a two post lift. It'd be better for my back and better to show you whatever I'm working on too. Oh well, dreams. Man, if you thought it looked bad from the top, you should see it from under here. Now I wanna get a view from the bottom side just to make sure I had everything out of the way but also the Corvette is made in different sections. It's easier to see from under here where I need to cut. For example, the firewall is all fiberglass and it comes to right here and then it's glued and pop riveted to the metal floorboard. By the way, the way I understand it is that GM engineers only switched to metal floorboards once they started adding catalytic converters and the heat started becoming a problem under here. So it's fiberglass, metal, until we get to behind the seat and then it's fiberglass again. So that's gonna be the best thing to look to cut out, but oh, it's ugly. One of my first purchases after bringing the vet home was a pair of new floor stampings from, I think it was Top Flight Automotive. Anyhow, it was a big spend at over $650 for both, but the floors were just way too far gone to try to get by with patches. Thankfully, it looks like they should fit mostly okay. So now I've just got to start cutting out the old stuff to make room for the new. I began by taking a few measurements of the floor level relative to the door seal and the seat belt mounting hole on the side. At first, I thought I wanted to cut around it and save that mount, but as you can see, the metal around that mounting boss was just too rotten and compromised. The last thing you want to have happen in a wreck is your seat belt anchors to come loose. So that'll be getting replaced with fresh new metal too. Thankfully, that already comes installed on the pans. So I just need to make sure they go back in the same spots. After staring, uh, after staring at it for far too long, I still can't tell exactly where I need to cut and where I shouldn't. So the plan, if you can call it that, is just to start cutting away the worst of the rust and slowly increase the size of the hole until I get scared and decide to quit. Now a situation like this, the best thing to do would be to use a plasma cutter and just zip it right out, but I don't have one. So obviously, the only thing left for me to do is go big. You can see how easily the Sawzall rips right through these floorboards. And even where there are no holes, 
The metal is so badly rusted, there's basically zero structural integrity left. And since I've already pulled the body off the frame, I don't have to worry about hitting cross members, brake lines, fuel lines, or anything else. I can just let her rip. The one place where I did have to use a little caution was where the steel floorboards meet up with the fiberglass firewall. The steel overlaps the fiberglass and the two are riveted together with either some seam sealer or panel bond in between. I just ground off the heads of the remaining rivets and whatever glue they used at the factory was so old and crusty it hardly put up any fight at all. After the big cut, the next step is to start trimming away the remaining rusty areas with the idea to leave at least an inch and a half to overlap with the new floorboards. The problem was everything was rusty, so it was hard to find a place to stop. On the transmission tunnel side, I figured if I had a nice straight cut line, it would make it easier to trim the new floor band stamping to fit. Of course, we all know marking and cutting a straight line on something with compound curves like this by hand is a pretty tough task. So I used a laser level and marked the line on it with masking tape. For me at least, this method makes things a lot easier. At this point, I thought I had to be getting close, but I wasn't. One of the great things about working with sheet metal is you can bend and move it to make it fit your needs. The stamping comes intentionally bigger than necessary, and it has slits along the edges so you can bend it inward in the tightest spots and let you finesse your fit. The biggest problem came with the way the existing sheet metal is bonded to the fiberglass door seal. Apparently, it was only done this way in like the 80 through 82 models. The fiberglass is bonded to the fenders and quarters, so you can't just remove it. And then the sheet metal is not only bonded to it, it curves up in this area directly underneath where the fiberglass stops, making it impossible to get the new pan in. So, to get something I could weld to, I had to cut some of the fiberglass away with an oscillating saw. After that, things started fitting a lot better. Okay, so here's the plan as it sits right now. The new floorboards came with really nice bosses to bolt in the seat mounts. And uh, the original metal, as you can see, is pretty rotten and crusty. So I definitely wanted that in there. Uh, what I did though was I cut the metal. You can see this goes right here, exactly like that as low as I could up against the seat mount to save as much as I could. And this metal that I was able to save, and there wasn't a lot of it that was really good that was left, is what I'm gonna to use to weld the new seat mounts to. So what I have to do now is trim the new sheet metal so it stops just underneath this line of the fiberglass door seal that wraps over here. Give me a place so it'll sit nice and flat and weld to it. With the floor panel closed, I decided it was time to try and remove as much of the rust and old seam sealer as I could. But then I ran into more issues. Well, it's a new day. And like a dummy, I got started working and forgot to turn the camera on. So now I need to back up a little bit and tell you what's going on. And actually it's not too hard to figure out what's going on is this car is full of rust. I had one area right here 
that wasn't covered by the floorboard, and so there was an opening all the way to the engine compartment. Started working here, and this little piece of metal came out with pretty much no problems. What's left of it, and as you can see, there is more seam sealer than there is metal. So this goes, open this up here, and now we need to make a pattern to make a little patch panel right here to totally seal off the floorboard. But just before I start on the patch panel, let me put this floor in one more time. Oops. Here, you can see just how much needs to be remade to properly seal off that hole on the passenger side floorboard from the elements. My method for making patterns for patch panels isn't very complex. I just treat it like preschool arts and crafts time. Basically, I just grab some scissors and poster board and start cutting. If I end up cutting too much, I just tape some more poster board back onto the pattern and try again. And if the shape is complex with a couple different angles like this one, I'll just start off by making a pattern for the biggest hole I want to fill and then slowly add to it from there. Finally, this is what I've come up with. Now I can transfer it over to some 22 gauge sheet metal, which is almost 3 hundredths of an inch thick. It's strong, but also easy to work with and can be cut with a pair of snips. I also needed to make a patch for this rusted out area just behind where the passenger seat would go. This is well through primer, which has a lot of either copper or zinc in it, depending on the brand. The idea with this stuff is it doesn't burn away when you weld through it. So it does a better job of protecting metal that's been welded from rust down the road. Now, I'm down to the fine tuning details. I spent a little time with a hammer and dolly trying to get the bends to better match the curve between the transmission tunnel and the firewall. With repop panels like these, you can never expect a perfect fit, but really, these aren't that bad. And I'm also at the point where I want the four panel to fit into the exact same spot and not shift around each time I fit it up. So, I drilled a hole near each corner and used a Clico to secure the panel exactly where I want it to be. Clicos are really common in stock car racing fabrication, but maybe not as much in other disciplines. At least, that's where I've learned about them. Essentially, a Clico is a temporary fastener that can be installed and removed as necessary with a pair of special Clico pliers. So, they're really helpful for pieces you've got to take in and out multiple times. So now it's time to finally install the passenger side floor panel permanently. For the area where the floor panel mates up to the fiberglass firewall, I'm using SEM or SEM multi-purpose panel adhesive. It's a two-part epoxy that has a specific mixing ratio. It's something like two to one. So one tube in the container is larger than the other. That's why it requires this special application gun. Now the official SEM gun will cost you like 200 bucks, but I found this one for just 45 on Amazon and it worked great. To help save you some money, if you ever take on a project like this, I'll put a link to it in the description for this video. Sim recommends you smear this stuff on the mating surfaces of both pieces you'll be bonding. Now beware, it is sticky as all get out and will make a mess if you aren't careful. But 
it has a 90 minute working time and it sets up in four hours. So you don't have to rush. So once the panel bond was applied to both the firewall and the steel floor pan, I installed it one last time, including the Clecos to make sure the panel was exactly where I wanted it. And then my dad came over and helped me pop rivet the panel to the firewall to make sure it was pulled nice and tight and give the panel bond the best possible chance to bite. Pop riveting the panel to the firewall is really only a two person job because I was on the backside holding some backing washers in place as dad popped in the rivets. I used backing washers just to help keep the fiberglass from splitting as the rivets tried to expand through the holes. Man, that panel bond was some nasty sticky stuff and it can get really messy if you're not careful, which I wasn't. But I've got it down and I think I've got enough rivets in place to give it a chance to really make a good secure bond. So the next step, at least for me, is to pop in some tech screws to pull it tight against the sides and start welding things up. And you can see the one spot up against the transmission tunnel where I have screwed up the old measure three times cut once just didn't work for me turned out when i was making my cuts i wasn't getting the floor pan all the way seated against the uh, the front of the firewall and then after i cut it i realized i was able to get it set further down and created that gap but that's okay it's just metal you can always weld on more If I have any advice here, it's to clean that original rusty metal as well as you possibly can before you start welding it. The new panels are punched from nice, thick 18 gauge steel and trying to weld that to rusty metal that's embedded with who knows what kind of contaminants ain't easy and some of my welds show it. Here's the semi-finished product. I've gone ahead and sprayed some self-etching primer over it just for a bit of protection. And I also plan to seam seal everything once the second pan is in place. Now it's on to the driver's side. And if anything, this one is even worse. It looks like it's already been patched multiple times. There's this large obvious patch that looks suspiciously like a paint can lid. But here you can see the seam of a more properly done patch. So I doubt the same person did both. Anyhow, there's still a ton of other holes. So just about the whole thing will need to come out. Oh, and check this out. What I'm calling the paint can patch wasn't even welded in. I got it out just using a screwdriver and there was only a gob of seam sealer or something else that was pretty weak holding it in place. Underneath, it only got worse. And then there was also a ton of sealer or something just globbed on everywhere that was pretty annoying to have to scrape out. Turns out it's a whole lot easier to get access to the floorboard of the car after you've already fled flinched on the thing. One change from before, while I did still trim up the fiberglass door sill like previously, I decided to cut away all the sheet metal I could get to underneath the door frame. 
The body underneath the door is molded around a nice thick piece of C-channel steel. So, instead of welding the new floor panel to the old sheet metal, I'll secure it directly to the C-channel with self-tapping tech screws in this area. Once the second floor pan was fully welded in, I applied a thick coat of seam sealer to fully seal the interior. And I'm talking about thick. I'm sure I way overdid it with the seam sealer and the results definitely aren't pretty. But I figure it'll eventually be covered by anti-vibration matting and some carpet. This is a historic moment. It's actually the first time I've been able to sit properly in my Corvette. And I didn't show it because I need to maintain a little bit of dignity on here. But I've been jumping up and down in here and the floor pans are solid. But they're also a little bit ugly with my bad seam sealer job. The uh, primer covers it up a little bit. There's more to be done underneath the car. I need to trim up some loose sheet metal, more seam sealing. Need to apply some sort of an underbody coating. But before I do that, I'm too excited about trying to get some seats in here. And I pulled some seats from a junkyard, not from a Corvette. I know the old C6 seat swap is pretty popular. I think these are going to work, but let me go through the Wayback Machine and show you what I found. All right, after a bit of a search, I may have found the winner right here on the end of the aisle. Here we got a Mazda. What is this? Mazda 3? I don't know what imports are. Mazda RX-8. Let me show you. I uh, can't get in. Hold on. Not too torn up. Of course, that doesn't matter to me. And look at these seats. They're not nasty. No mystery stains. I can tell. You look all right. But get on there. Best of all. They're only about 18 and a quarter inches wide, so that should fit in the Corvette. I really like that. They're not going to match up with the style, but they're clean and they're small and lightweight. One down, one to go. Get you out of here. Take you to your new home. And here is one of the seats I pulled out of the RX-8 back in the shop. As you can see, they're still in pretty good shape. And what I liked about them was I needed them to be small to be able to fit in the Corvette cabin. But I also wanted them free of all of the motors and heaters and massagers and all the other things that most modern seats come with. Because I just didn't want all that junk in the Corvette. So these should fit the bill, even though they're not the most beautiful seats in the world. But don't do me for now. The thing I did notice that was hidden until I pulled it out of the car was at some point this seat has been on fire. It's melted the plastic cover, but nothing structurally is hurt, so I think we're okay. And as you can tell, I've already spent some time cutting off all the bracketry and everything used to mount the seat in the Mazda. So that's all out of the way, and I'll show you that here in a second. But now we've got to figure out how to get it in the Corvette. The first step is to strip everything off the seats that I don't need. The wiring is for the seatbelt warning light and a side bolster airbag. Now I can't remove the airbag without ruining the seat, but cutting the power cord should disable it so it can't go off. I want the seats to be mounted in the Corvette as low as possible, and the existing brackets won't work anyway. So everything gets cut off and ground down smooth right down to the seat. There we go. So, I 
I guess that's about it. That was eh, fun, but at least it's done. And now, man, I got metal everywhere. I think it's time to go clean up. Next up, the seat bottom actually does have to come out. I wish I had done this earlier so I could see how the tracks fit in the car and mark up where to mount to some new brackets. I made these simple tabs for the runners on the back of the seats out of eighth inch plate. Why eighth inch? Well, mainly that's what I had left over from my chassis repairs, which was covered in a previous video. If you haven't seen that one, I'll leave a link for it in the right hand corner and please do watch it. Hey, I've got a house painting to make. There are mounting holes in the floor pans for the front bracket, but not for the rear. So, after marking the spots, I drilled them to accept 5 16 bolts. The 5 16 bolt size is OEM, and it also fits the threaded seat anchors that came with the pans. Then I can install the seats and sketch up some patterns to connect the front of the sliders to the existing forward mounting point. And I've already showed you my big screw up using my old wife's bath towels, but this is where it happened in the build. The cheer wine did work for putting out the fire, but man, did it leave a sticky mess. From now on, I'm keeping a small fire extinguisher on the welding part. And I may have just started a fire, but of course, I still had to finish the job. The bath towels, by the way, were a total loss. But the good news is the brackets matched up to the bolt holes and everything fit perfectly. Here, you can see how these brackets help keep the seat down and as close to the floor as absolutely possible, which was critical for a good fit in the car. Let's try this out. Hey, not too bad. Seat is straight. It's nice and low, I'm not up over the roof. I think this will work. One down, one to go. Now, it's on to seat number two. But first, I had to make a trip to my local hazard fault to correct my mistake and pick up an inflammable, or is that unflammable? Non-flammable? Oh well, a fiberglass welder's blanket that won't catch fire. I also picked up my first ever pair of real deal welder's gloves and a new paint pen. It was a regular shopping spree. And then it was on to making patterns to fit the front mounts like before.
This time around, I bolted the brackets to the floorboard before tack welding them to the frame with the seat in place. And then I can finish welding everything up on the workbench. You already saw anchors like these for the seat belt mounts. They are also already welded in place for the front seat mounts, but they come loose for the rears. They provide plenty of surface area to keep the mounting bolts from ripping through the sheet metal in the event of a crash. Now they don't have to be fully welded to the underside of the seat pan. Someday down the road, I may want to swap out for some nicer seats. So I just tag them in place so they will stay in position as I pull the seats in and out while the build continues. All right, let's see. Not too bad. Not too bad for, I think it was like 120 bucks at the junkyard they charged me for this. One thing I did realize, maybe a little bit too late, is that when I welded my new brackets directly to the sliders, the floors in the Corvette aren't totally level and I bolted them down tight and they got a little bit tight and draggy, but that's okay. Really, I'm gonna be the only one that's driving this car anyway. And by the way, did I tell you I finally decided on a name for this project car? Based on all of the bad surprises it's given me with the rust everywhere, and also the things I plan to do with this car that's gonna have the numbers matching purists clutching their pearls, I decided to call this the Abomination Corvette. I think it works. Anyhow, really liking the seats. They're not perfect, but they're great for what I want. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and come back next time for more great builds.